Previously on Mafia. During the first half of the 20th century, the Los Angeles crime family was one of the most notable mafia groups in America, with a history of bootlegging, illegal gambling operations, and extortion. The L.A. Mafia earned its place as a powerful crime family. After growing up immersed in Cleveland's criminal underworld, Aladina Fratiano, better known as Jimmy Fratiano, traveled to the West Coast. Fratiano quickly gained a notable reputation in the L.A. crime family, winning the trust and favor of mob boss Jack Dragna. He gets out to California and forms friendships with other Italian mobsters out there. There is a crime family in southern and Los Angeles area. He connects with Jack Dragna, who is the boss. He connects with a San Diego mobster named Frank the Bomp Bompancero, who was kind of the, the underboss or a capo who ran the San Diego crew. And he and the Bomp will become good friends and trust each other and, and do a lot of business together over the years. Fratiano was known to be trustworthy and as someone who could get the job done. In that culture, he was an admired personality and they knew that Jimmy could carry out just about whatever deed needed to be done. And of course, he proved uh, over the years that he was quite capable of doing that. As an LA mobster, Fratiano was a part of several major hits including both enemies and troublesome members within the L.A. crime family. Jimmy, by that time, had a reputation of being someone with a great deal of uh, loyalty, uh, someone that could be trusted, someone that had encountered the legal arm of uh, uh, both folks in, in Cleveland and really was starting to become known around the country. And it's probably for those reasons that Nick Licata in Los Angeles wanted Jimmy to take on the contract to hit Broncado in Frombino. And Jimmy saw that as an opportunity. And he knew thereafter that he would no longer be seen as a, a thug or a uh, small-time uh, criminal. He saw it as his opportunity to make his name across the country, and indeed, it did. But things were about to change for the L.A. crime family, and it would set the course for Fratiano's ultimate betrayal. This is Mafia. In 1960, after being released from a six-and-a-half-year prison sentence for attempted extortion, the L.A. crime family looked very different from how Jimmy Fratiano had left it. Longtime boss Jack Dragna had died of a heart attack, and a man by the name of Frank DeSimone, a lawyer turned mobster, was voted in as his replacement. However, DeSimone was not as well-liked as Dragna had been and many notable figures from the L.A. crime family began to distance themselves, including Jimmy Fratiano. Fratiano soon moved to San Francisco. He had transferred to the Chicago outfit, but remained active in California and Las Vegas. Gary Jenkins, the host and producer of the true crime podcast Gangland Wire, talks more about this time. He always stayed loyal and connected to the Cleveland family. He'll affiliate with a small family up in San Francisco. He lived up in San Francisco at one point in time, and the boss up there was a guy named James or Jimmy the Hat Lanza. Now, the San Francisco boss never liked him. In his biography, The Last Mafioso, Fratiano stated that by 1973, he answered to San Francisco crime boss James Lanza. However, the two had a tumultuous relationship. He didn't like any attention being drawn to his little family up there. Fratiano, by this point in time in the 70s, was kind of a mob star and a lot of attention from some hits he'd done and just other things he'd gotten into. He was well known nationally, and, and this guy never really liked him in San Francisco. Researcher and screenwriter Ray Tracy says Fratiano did not think highly of Lanza. The two of them never got along. Jimmy didn't respect him. Lanza didn't like how much 
attention Jimmy brought to San Francisco. I think uh, Jimmy said all he does is sell insurance and olive oil. He doesn't do anything else. So it's just very little respect between them. It was just a lot of animosity, no respect with each other. Dennis McDonald acted as Fratiano's lawyer for 20 years and says much of the friction came from Fratiano's favorable reputation. Jimmy became almost an icon in the La Cosa Nostra from coast to coast. And the jealousy, the inability of any of, of the leadership in LA to rise to that level within the organization was a source of animosity for the balance of, well, really the balance of Jimmy's life and their lives, uh, as a matter of fact. Is there something interfering with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? This past year has been difficult for everyone, myself included. That's why I'm so thankful for BetterHelp. BetterHelp was able to assess my needs and match me with my own licensed professional therapist. And truly, my therapist has been a lifesaver. BetterHelp is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. So you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. Better help is more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit betterhelp.com forward slash mafia. That's better H-E-L-P and join the over one million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. And Mafia listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com forward slash Mafia. In 1976, Fratiano was offered an opportunity that caused him to return to his old stomping grounds in Los Angeles. At the time, the boss of the L.A. family was a man named Dominic Brooklier. While in charge... Brooklier was arrested on extortion charges and sentenced to 20 months in prison. Before he was put away, Brooklier nominated Louis Tom Dragna, Jack Dragna's nephew, to become the acting boss of the L.A. crime family. Louis Dragna didn't really want to. He had, he had been a made guy, but he'd been running a successful clothing company and didn't really want the responsibility or to have to take the heat. Louis Dragna was not keen on the idea of running the mob family and agreed to do it on one condition, that Jimmy Fratiano be brought in to act as his co-boss. Louis Dragna, honestly, Jimmy didn't have a whole lot of respect for. He saw him as part of what he called the Mickey Mouse Mafia, which was the L.A. family, kind of the West Coast. You got to remember that Jimmy was used to dealing in, with Chicago and some dealings in New York a little bit. And so he was used to well-regimented, aggressive families. And the uh, West Coast family just wasn't that. So he always called them the Mickey Mouse Mafia. They never really did much. He didn't have a lot of respect for it. But... When Louis Dragna approached him on it, it was a, it's a hell of an offer. And he ended up consulting actually with the Cleveland family because he believed they had more respect than the, the West Coast guys and, and Chicago. And everyone kind of encouraged him to do it. He was counseled and, and he agreed he would go back and help be the co-boss while Brooklyn Air was in the penitentiary. And it was kind of interesting that three men, Brooklyn Air, Louis Dragon, and Fratiano, had all been inducted into the Los Angeles crime family at the same time in 1947. Louis was known as a reluctant prince because he was so hesitant to take this job. Fratiano agreed, knowing that most of the power of acting boss would rest in his hands. A lot of mob guys, including Fratiano, always claimed that Louis Dragna never really made his bones and was not really a committed member of the mob. He was just a legacy because of his uncle and his dad. 
The original deal was that Louis and Jimmy were kind of co-bosses and that was the deal with the family, but Louis kind of pulled him off to the side and said, hey, I'm not interested in the day-to-day. -day. You run the day-to-day, -day. you know, this will be co-run, but it isn't, um, not really. <laughs> he wanted nothing to do with the day-to-day. -day. He wanted Jimmy to really take it, take the reins over and move forward. Fratiano spent his time as acting boss traveling around the country, making deals and forming connections with other crime families. It seemed as though Fratiano was looking to restore the L.A. crime family to its glory days of Jack Dragna's time, as the family had been in a steady decline of power since his death. Fratiano was a go-getter. He was in a lot of business deals with New York and some serious hitters, and I think he was really just outshining Brooklier as a boss. It is also believed that Fratiano hoped that by doing this, he would secure his spot as permanent boss of the L.A. crime family. To uh, serve in that capacity, in Jimmy's view, was, was an honor and a recognition of what he had brought to the La Cosa Nostra nationwide over a long period of time. He wanted to run the show. He didn't want the acting title. And I think he might have... I'm not sure if he overstepped his bounds, but he really got into a lot of deals with a lot of serious people and brought some real money into the West Coast Mafia and maybe taking him out of that Mickey Mouse role that he liked to call him in. However, after his release from prison, Brooke Lear returned to power as boss of the family, and Jimmy Fratiano returned to his former position of soldier. The demotion did not sit well with Fratiano. It was no secret that Jimmy Fratiano had developed issues with the L.A. crime family. His attitude toward the leadership and actions of the mob had changed dramatically since the death of Jack Dragna in 1956. He had a falling out with Lanza and with Brooklier and Shorntino of L.A. Jimmy had no respect for those guys. He told me at great length he viewed them as, in his words, punks. He would describe them as people that never did any work and probably couldn't. So he had a, a very low opinion of them. And from their side, I think there was a lot of jealousy of Jimmy's reputation exceeding that of, of any of those folks. By then, Jimmy uh, was known throughout the uh, country. The, all the five bosses in New York knew Jimmy on a first-name basis, and he knew them. In 1977, a hit was put out on Fratiano's longtime friend, Frank Bompensaro. It was discovered that Bompensaro had been acting as an FBI informant, a fact which devastated Fratiano. He was one of Jimmy's best friends. Along with Johnny Roselli, was, uh, they were close, they confided in each other, they you know, had dinner together. It was, a, it was more than just a family relationship. They were very tight. And when Jimmy found out that Frank was talking to the FBI, uh, I'm sure it was heartbreaking. You know, I just get that feeling from things I've read, things I've heard, that it was just really tough for him. I've heard all these rumors of how ultimately it was discovered that Bob and Sierra had been talking to the FBI. And I'll tell you something, I was, I was with Jimmy on a trip to Las Vegas when Jimmy figured out after the Las Vegas police came to his hotel room when no other person other than he and I knew that he would be in Vegas that uh, weekend with the exception of Bob and Sierra. And it was Jimmy that figured out, as a consequence of that incident, that Bomp was talking to someone. And Jimmy was heartbroken when he, when he figured that out, because he and Bomp were so close for so many years and had been through so many events together. It was a, uh, an earthquake in Jimmy's life. But there was no denying that Bompensaro had changed sides. It seems that Bompensaro had been turned by the FBI during this case that he'd caught with Fratiano for defrauding employees and filing false invoices on a federal road project. 
The Southern California family was big into porn at this point in time with all the uh, movie industry out there. And I've got actors and producers and directors, writers and all that. And Bump set up several Los Angeles mob guys in an FBI sting into the porn business. Fratiano was approached to carry out the murder of Bump and Sorrow. However, he stalled on the orders until it was finally handed over to another mobster. Fratiano figured at the time that maybe is the only reason they even asked him to do that. They knew this was coming. He was one of the few guys that could ever set up Bump and Sorrow. He was infuriated about that, and he felt like he'd been tricked. Now, he just kept jerking him around and did not carry through on the contract until finally uh, another guy, young mob associate in the Los Angeles family, agreed to kill Bombacero. As much as it hurt him, Fratiano did end up playing a small part in the hit on one of his oldest friends. Frank was shot in a phone booth, a uh, pay phone booth in San Diego, uh, his home turf, and Jimmy had to uh, set that up. He set up the operations for that. Jimmy wasn't directly involved uh, in the hit. In fact, he uh, suggested that Brooklier make the phone call that Jimmy set up between Bob and Sierra and Brooklier to lure Frank to a phone booth there in, in San Diego where the uh, hit took place. He didn't actually do the shooting, but he was part of that event that I, I think, I personally just think it must, it must have been just soul crushing for him to do that because they were just so close. It'd be like killing your best friend, you know? It's just something that you can't take lightly and you, I'm sure it just weighed on him. Let's take a break from all the literal crime and discuss something that just feels like a crime. Abandoning your old furniture when you move to a new place, simply because it's too difficult to move. And then what? You buy another cheap sofa to replace it. Maybe one you don't even like. One that you'll throw away the next time you move. Stop being that person. Buy furniture you truly love that will last from one home to the next. Burrow. Burrow is easy to assemble and easy to move. Burrow's innovative modular design and super helpful instructions make assembling and disassembling your furniture quick and hassle-free. And when you order your Burrow online, you can make sure it's really made for you with thousands of ways to customize. Plus, Burrow's world-class support team is available for you whenever you need. Burrow sofas feature durable, stain- and scratch-resistant fabric made to withstand the wear and tear of guests, pets, little ones, whatever comes your way. Their award-winning Nomad Sofa has a built-in USB charger for all-day power. And they have fast and free shipping on every order saving you an average of $100 on large items like a couch and a logistics headache. Right now, you can get $75 off your first order at burrow.com forward slash mafia. That's burrow, B-U-R-R-O-W dot com forward slash mafia for $75 off your burrow purchase. Burrow.com forward slash mafia. After the murder of Bomp and Sorrow, Fratiano's relationship with the L.A. crime family continued to grow more strained, and his allies were becoming fewer and fewer. His closest friend, Johnny Rosselli, shows up in a barrel. His close friend, Frank Bomp and Sorrow, he's now involved in helping to set up his uh, murder. Carlo Gambino had passed. Sam Giancana was now out of the picture. And the Licaboli family in Cleveland as well. So all of these folks that Jimmy had grown close to over decades were suddenly gone. You know, your friend's dying and there's just no one. You don't have that support anymore and you're getting older and the newer crews coming in, the newer guys coming up don't have the respect. You know, they don't dress the right way. They're talking about getting into drugs and other things that uh, the old school guys just didn't do. They didn't want to do it and they didn't believe in it. 
And uh, he saw a change in what uh, was described as the old uh, mafioso versus the uh, new, as he would uh, call them, Turks, who didn't understand the code and wasn't 100% committed to living, again, what he viewed as the uh, code of honor. It's kind of the beginning of the end, honestly, is how I look at it. Jimmy Fratiano's failing relationship with the mob was finally about to come to a head. In the spring of 1977, Jimmy Fratiano was summoned to a meeting with Brooklier. Brooklier really started kind of a campaign to discredit Fratiano. He confronted him, said he heard he'd been running a separate crew in the Los Angeles territory and not kicking up to him. Told him he had a bad mouth, just like Bompensero had. And in an attempt to discredit him, Brooklier began to spread rumors about Fratiano. Fratiano learned that Brooklier started a rumor that he had really never made Fratiano the acting boss and that Fratiano was really misrepresenting himself. And he suspected that Israeli was trying to poison his name with other mob guys because with a guy like Fratiano, you would have to get a hit on him sanctioned it because he had been this member of Chicago Outfit. He was so well connected with Cleveland and other crime families. Uh, you would have to get a sanction to do this. And, and if he made him look bad enough, he might get it sanctioned. Brooklier recognized that the Chicago family was playing a uh, larger and larger role on the West Coast. The uh, La Cosa Nostra in L.A. were basically uh, going broke if they weren't already. And in all of that background and the jealousy I referred to uh, earlier led Brooklier and Shorentino to side uh, uh, Jimmy uh, should go. As things were becoming more unstable for Fratiano's reputation and status within the mob, Dennis McDonald recalls feeling a distant shift in Fratiano's behavior. One incident in particular happened as Fratiano prepared to appear in court after being indicted for shaking down a fake FBI porn operation. You know, I'll never forget the uh, evening Jimmy come up and spent the day. We were watching uh, football on Sunday. He wanted me to go with him to his first appearance in L.A. with regard to uh, that indictment. I think I told him I'd make some flight arrangements and, and we'd fly down to L.A. As only Jimmy could, uh, he took his cigar out of his mouth and said, Dennis, we got to do better than that. I, I don't want to fly down there commercially. So I made arrangements for us to uh, have a pilot fly us to, first I thought LAX, but Jimmy let me know at the last minute he wanted to go to Burbank. And he didn't want anyone picking him up. He wanted to make sure we took a cab, and he wanted to make sure I didn't let anyone know that he was going to be traveling with me to that court hearing. So it didn't take a genius to understand that something uh, was going on in Jimmy's life and his relationship with the L.A. family that was significant. Brooklier eventually did put a hit out on Fratiano. It became clear that there was a contract out on Jimmy. And uh, Jimmy was furious. And it was at that time, really, that Jimmy started to really confide in me for the first time. And we had a conversation where he talked about uh, an impending uh, war. He had connections with the uh, Mexican mafia that uh, he had fostered while he was in prison. And Jimmy was bent on getting even with Brooklier and Sorrentino. Dennis McDonald recounts one of the attempted hits on Fratiano's life. Jimmy was living in a home that I owned over on the Pacific Coast at Moss Beach. Jimmy recognized that two of the members of the uh, L.A. family were there to uh, do the hit. Jimmy uh, comes home with skinny balada, and uh, they see Joy Hansen's red and white Thunderbird cruising past his house. Now, most people under those circumstances might take shelter or seek some help. Jimmy's reaction was to jump in the car and chase him. He gets right behind him, and they recognize that it's uh, Jimmy, and they try to take off, and Jimmy passes him at one point, gets far enough ahead that he turns the car around and heads for him. Skinny Velada was 
Uh, I thought he was going to die of fright. And at the last moment, Mike Rizzatello and uh, Joey Hansen that were in the vehicle swerved, just missing uh, uh, Jimmy. And Velada asked Jimmy, Jesus, Crimey, what are you doing? And Jimmy says, well, I gave them a choice. And uh, we found out what they have inside of them. These guys don't understand. I'm the one that taught them how to do this. Becoming concerned for his safety, Fratiano decided to break the number one rule of organized crime. But he also knew he was getting older. He had uh, some regrets about the lifestyle he had undertaken, and all of his closest friends in the organization had passed by natural causes or otherwise. And so it was a time in his life where he really had to come to grips with how he wanted to spend his last years. So at that point, uh, uh, he was talking to Jim Ahern. Over the years, he had developed a relationship with an FBI agent named Jim Ahern. Lots of times mob guys will do this. They'll trade little bits of gossip and innuendo and maybe even trade off a good bus to the agent in order for the agent to do something for them in the future. That you never know when you'll need some help from the other side. Jim Ahern ended up reaching out to Jimmy over the years, trying to flip him. Jim Ahern was very plugged into all of LCN and the goings on with that and knew that Fradiano was getting himself in a position where he was in trouble. And there was multiple events that kind of created that. Jim was very accommodating. He kind of brought him in slowly and did little things. It was kind of a give and take relationship in the beginning. And then it ended up being a life and death later as things got heated more and more heated. Jim Ahern was uh, telling him what, what I was telling him. It's time to uh, change sides. Otherwise, you're going to end up dead sooner than later. And uh, maybe there was another alternative. From Campside Media, Chameleon's new second season, High Rollers, tells the seedy story of Operation Botox, an FBI undercover investigation designed to catch money launderers. Hosted by investigative journalist Trevor Aronson, this new season uses FBI undercover recordings that take listeners on a journey inside a two-year sting operation that goes off the rails in ways both tragic and comic. Set in Sin City, Las Vegas, Nothing comes short to this mind-blowing heist that involves all the classic Vegas highs and lows. High rollers get involved in a money laundering scheme. An informant runs his own scams. A reported love triangle. Strippers. And millions at stake. Like exactly what you see in the movies. Except this actually happened. It's an investigative thriller that challenges listeners to consider and question the enormous, unchecked powers of the FBI and federal agents' decisions to investigate unsuspecting Americans. Listen and subscribe to Chameleon High Rollers on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. With the encouragement of his lawyer Dennis McDonald and Jim Ahern, the lifelong mobster Jimmy Fratiano became a government witness against the L.A. Mafia. I think he even knew, especially at the end before he flipped, that his time would have been up pretty soon. Like, he can't keep dodging bullets. And I think between uh, Dennis and Jim and just the events of the LCN, the pressure that he put on him, that he just flipped. He became the government witness. On his own terms, though. The selling point was would give him an opportunity to see that those who wanted his demise would spend time in jail, in his words, giving them time to think about what they had in mind. And uh, he did. I think across the country, ultimately the count was he sent 17 high-ranking mafioso to prison. That's a uh, remarkable turnaround for a man that lived the life that he did. Among other things, the testimony Fratiano provided as a government witness resulted in racketeering convictions of five reputed mafia figures, and it also made the target on Fratiano's back ten times bigger. At one point, 
Fratiano claimed that the Mafia had a $100,000 contract on his life. In 1980, Jimmy Fratiano entered the Witness Protection Program. However, he had a close call when one of his locations was made known. There was an incident where it turned out later that one of the FBI secretaries leaked or was paid off and gave the location of Jimmy to some of the LCN members. And one of the attempts on his life was, for instance, the one in Boise, Idaho. Two guys found Jimmy. Uh, they cruised past his apartment, found Jimmy in a phone booth making a call. And uh, Jimmy knew that he was about to meet his demise. He uh, ran from that phone booth, ran back to the apartment, and made two calls. He called Jim Ahern, and he called me. And the uh, folks in the Witness Protection Program got him out of Boise in a matter of hours. And he ultimately ended up uh, thereafter living for a while in Missoula, Montana, of all places. Just little things that he was able to dodge. His ability to figure that out, I think, saved his life multiple times. But just the ultra awareness that he had also in the Witness Protection Program kind of saved him. The Witness Protection Program itself, I don't think is was developed nearly like it is today. And it just had a lot of holes and he was just running constantly. After the incident, Dennis McDonald requested a meeting to discuss Fratiano's safety. I organized a meeting with Rudy Giuliani who was the head of the strike force in Washington, D.C. Uh, Jim Henderson, who was heading the strike force at that time in Los Angeles. And Bud McPherson, who was in charge of Jimmy's safety in the witness protection program. So <laughs> we're there in the uh, Department of uh, Justice large room. We're sitting uh, around this big oak table in, uh, in walks Rudy Giuliani with a couple of underlings. Giuliani says, oh, you must be uh, Mr. Fratiano. And uh, Jimmy says, fuck you. Listen, you piece of shit. You almost had me killed. And Giuliani turns white. And I mean, <laughs> Giuliani, I don't think has ever been talked to like this. And uh, Jimmy says, you motherfuckers have a duty to take care of me and you better do it. And he's pounding the table and he's pulling his cigar in and out of his mouth. And Giuliani's sitting in his chair shaking. And finally, Giuliani says, look, we've got a great record. We've had X number of people on this program, and we haven't lost a single one yet. And Jimmy says, you're a goddamn liar. I took care of two of you guys you had on the program. So with this tense hearing, and uh, we came up with a, a program where only three people from then on would know his whereabouts. Jim Henderson in L.A., Jim Ahern, and Bud McPherson, and of course myself. So it was quite a meeting. But after that, we were able to move Jimmy around the country on several occasions. He ended up building a house up in the state of Washington and then later moved to Oklahoma City uh, where I was able to buy him a condominium and he spent the balance of his life there. Fratiano would continue to talk about his time in the L.A. crime family, publishing two biographies and appearing in televised interviews. Then, in 1993, Jimmy Fratiano died at the age of 79. He died of natural causes. I mean, of all the things this guy has seen, been through, done, survived, you would never... I mean, the odds of him surviving until full life are just so ridiculously low. But he did. And he died of Alzheimer's in, in uh, you know, watching a football game on his couch. Fratiano had an extensive career in organized crime. From his early days in the Cleveland crime world to being involved in some of the most brutal hits in the L.A. mob's history, he is remembered as one of the most notorious members of the L.A. crime family and the one that led to its demise. I think, you know, he kind of regretted the things he did. And it's really his life, his whole life cycle is amazing that he lived that long. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's funny or not, but it's kind of funny to me that he was able to do that. Jimmy had the qualities 
of what today we would think of a mafioso core character. Loyalty, trustworthy enough with the ability to do what uh, you and I would perceive as some uh, terrible things, but do them well and to the advantage of those that ask him. Uh, Jimmy was fearless and it showed. And yet he carried himself with a sense of dignity. He spoke well. He was extremely bright. He was always dressed well and carried himself as a, uh, as a leader to any group that he might be with, including later members of the uh, FBI and, and uh, witness protection people. They enjoyed being around him. He, was, uh, he had a great sense of humor. He could tell the most terrible stories and you would find yourself chuckling about it until you left and realized what he had just described. This has been Mafia, an Audioboom original series, hosted by me, Fleet Cooper. It is produced by Audioboom's Lauren Vogel, Blair Payton, Pam Burroughs, Karen Bevan, and Rachel Jacobs. Executive producers for Audioboom are Brendan Regan and Stuart Last. Special thanks to Gary Jenkins, Dennis McDonald, and Ray Tracy for providing expert insight for this episode. Follow Mafia on Spotify or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows. Next week on Mafia. In the heart of Mississippi, the Dixie Mafia was known for their illegal gambling, drug trafficking, and violent tendencies. The best way I can find to describe the Dixie Mafia is a freelance band of criminals. And so they would work together with whatever type of crime they wanted to commit. They would call whoever was specialized in that type of crime. And as the leader, Kirksey Nix was no stranger to violence, eventually being charged for several murders and even ordering a hit from prison. That is actually the case that brought the Dixie Mafia into the media spotlight. Up until then, they had spent decades flying under the radar. Nobody publicly wanted to admit that there was such a thing as organized crime in the South. And so it was kind of like the Italian Mafia back in, you know, J. Edgar Hoover's day. 